Today we're going to be discussing the pilgrims and the persecution that led them to the New World. Now, we're going to start off with Henry VIII. Do you remember this guy, Henry VIII? And thanks to Henry, we're able to start our story. Now, he was married to his first wife, Catherine, and through her, he had a daughter named Mary. Now, keep that in mind because she's going to be a very important figure in just a moment. If you remember from the last video, Henry wanted to leave the Catholic Church because he saw that Anne Boleyn was a babe, and he wanted her to produce him a son in order to secure his Tudor dynasty. However, there was one small problem, and that was the Catholic Church. Henry wanted to divorce his wife Catherine and marry Anne Boleyn. Now, remember how I said that the Catholic Church was a problem? That's because they said that this divorce was a no-no. So, he decided he was going to create a new church that would let him do so, and so create the church he did. From the pangs of lust for Anne, the opportunity to marry her, and the desire to divorce Catherine of Aragon, came the Church of England. In September 1533, Anne gave birth to a baby girl who would later become known as Elizabeth I. Now keep this in mind that Henry wanted a son because he was trying to establish his Tudor dynasty. However, Elizabeth, after two miscarriages, Henry began to look for solutions outside of his marriage. Anne was put on a sham trial for the accusations of adultery and plotting against the king's life, and then sentenced and imprisoned. On May 19, 1536, Anne was beheaded, and Henry married Jane Seymour 11 days after her execution. Kind of kind of suspect, right? There's no way that this is something that the king wanted, right? Poor Anne wasn't even cold yet. And Henry marries Jane Seymour, remember, 11 days after her execution. Later on, on January 28, 1547, at the age of 55, Henry VIII assumed room temperature, likely due to his sickness and his age, and his obesity was more than likely a contributing factor to all this. However, all this ended up giving way to the rise of his daughter, Bloody Mary. Do you remember the first little girl that Henry had with Catherine, Mary? Well, she was declared illegitimate by her father and spent most of her days confined in the Hatfield house until Jane suggested that he reconcile with his daughter. Remember, she would definitely have a grudge against her father due to being proclaimed as an illegitimate child because he wanted to marry the babe Anne Boleyn. From then on, Mary returned to spending time at Greenwich along the other royal palaces. Henry restored her to the line of secession in 1544 under the encouragement from his last wife, Catherine Parr. However, with Henry self-proclaimed head of the Church of England, this rehabilitation was somewhat an uneasy one as Mary remained loyal to her Catholic faith. Her Catholicism would later become the guiding principle of her reign and would define her reputation following her death. After the death of King Edward VI, Jane ascended to the throne for nine short days, and then Mary gathered support, rode into London, and had Jane and her husband executed, and then became the queen. She further solidified her Catholicism in 1554 by getting married to Prince Philip II, the Prince of Spain. During her five-year reign of terror, she quashed an uprising, placed her half-sister Elizabeth in prison, burned 280 Protestants for refusing to convert to the Catholic faith, and another 800 Protestants fled the country. In 1558, she was ill and was growing increasingly weak. Due to her not being able to conceive a Catholic heir, she was forced to recognize Elizabeth as the legitimate heir and finally passed away. After Mary died, on November 17, 1558, Elizabeth I rose to the throne, but she understood very deeply that Mary's position was horribly unpopular with the English people. As Ben Hart puts it in his book, Faith and Freedom, her views, Mary's views, did not represent England's, a fact that was obvious to her successor, Elizabeth I. Elizabeth attempted a new approach. Instead of rigid religious orthodoxy, she instituted a broad church, which was to put England on an even keel, and be accommodating to as many Christian perspectives as politically possible. 
This is a wonderfully insightful view into Elizabeth's policy for religion. Because Elizabeth was very famous for her via media, or her middle road policy concerning the church. She tried a middle of the road approach, which won her the admiration of both the Catholic citizens of England and the ire of the Puritans. Listen to this excerpt. The sect that gave Elizabeth and her reform plan the most difficulty was the Puritans. This sect was a group of radical Protestants who were determined to purify the church. They wished to eliminate the superstitions of the Catholic Church and bring the church back to the primitive form of the apostolic church, following only the scriptures. They challenged Elizabeth's church reforms, stating that there was too much ritual and superstition in the reform. In order to deal with the Puritans, Elizabeth first tried compromising, giving them scriptural purity in the 39 articles while maintaining the Catholic structure. But the Puritans stayed true to their name and desired to purify the church of all things non-scriptural. Then, after Archbishop Edmund Grindall died in 1583, after a long suspension, Elizabeth appointed a Protestant who was an anti-Puritan, John Whitgift, who dealt with the Puritans with an iron fist, persecuting the clergy who refused to conform to the English church. Now this was extremely important because in just a little bit we're going to look at the distinction between the Puritans and the uh, Protestants and even the Separatists. But the reason why these people were called the Puritans in the first place was because they thought the doctrine of the Church of England and the Catholic Church alike were corrupt. They wanted to purify the doctrine and be free from all corruption. They were of the mind that anything that was not explicitly in the Bible should not be imposed as practice upon the church. Due to this, though, they became a great annoyance to Elizabeth and the ruling class, and when John Whitgift was appointed as the new archbishop, who was, by the way, a Protestant, he ruled with an iron fist and began persecuting the Puritan clergy and those who refused to conform. Hi, or hey, I'm actually not quite sure how it's pronounced, H-A-I-G-H, also states that Elizabeth feared the Catholics on the inside, and it was for this reason that she fought so hard to keep England on the conservative end of Protestantism. This fear, unfortunately, led to the alienation of more radical Protestants, and in the end caused many of the difficulties that arose in Elizabeth's church settlement. Hi, or hey, agrees with Collinson, that the grassroots reform grew out of Elizabeth's control to some extent. Now here's the distinction that we have to make with the Protestants, the Puritans, and the Separatists. Of course we've seen the Protestants are those who broke away from the Catholic Church because of the doctrinal impurity. However, the Puritans were those who thought that they could work from within the Church, particularly the Church of England, to purify the doctrine from within. And the Separatists were those who thought that there was no hope of purifying the church whatsoever from within, and they broke away completely from the Church of England. And from here, we will see the important role that they will play in the formation of America. With this alienation in mind, James I steps onto the scene and becomes the King of England in 1603. King James was a monarchical absolutist, which means that anything he said goes and would undermine and even sidestep the parliament in order to get his way. James continued the Elizabethan Catholic suppression, and in 1605 a group of Catholics attempted the Gunpowder Plot, which was a plot that was crafted by Robert Catsby to blow up the parliament, the king, the queen, and his son, and hope that the confusion that was created by killing the king and the officials would create a vacuum that would allow English Catholics to take over the country. After the gunpowder plot failed, James attempted to stamp out all nonconformity among both the Puritans and the Catholics by prosecuting them. James had no allegiance but to himself. He didn't side with any religion, but would pursue his own absolutist policies that aligned with himself than any particular faith. The only church he wanted to use was the Church of England to further solidify his power and again, this would echo the sentiments of the forefathers of having a wall of separation between the church and the state. King James used the power of the government to force everyone to attend services that were sanctioned by the Church of England. In 1608, a group of separatists led by William Brewster and John Robinson fled England to Holland for holding illegal services in secret that were not sanctioned by the Church of England. And from this group, we hear the familiar names of John Carver, 
William Brewster, and of course, William Bradford. Hello there. I just wanted to say Merry Christmas. As you can see, I have a little bit of Christmas decorations up. Oh, I guess there's the tree over there. You check that out. So, anyway, I just wanted to say Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you so much for your support. I know I kind of started a little bit late this year, but it was a lot of preparation to get to where I'm at. Um, I know even my setup's kind of not that great, but it's okay. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you all for your continued support, and I hope that you will continue to support me throughout the new year in 2024. Uh, again, I wanted to say Merry Christmas, and I hope you guys have a wonderful new year. Oh, and around here, I'm not afraid to tell you uh, Merry Christmas because I love Christmas and uh, I think it's a wonderful holiday where, where we are able to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So uh, as long as I am the captain of this ship, I will be saying Merry Christmas to you all. But uh, again, thank you so much for your support. Thank you for uh, sticking around and I hope uh, to be improving um, as the year as the years progress and as the as especially as 2024 goes on um, I will prepare you uh, there's going to be a few a few um, well, weeks and maybe even into a month or two later on down in 2024 where I will not be able to uh, do this for a little break for a little bit so I'll have to take a little bit of a break but I promise it's for a good reason that I will reveal in due time but there's an exciting uh, lineup that I have for 2024 uh, that I actually can't wait to reveal. I promise I will get to more modern uh, topics. Uh, I could give you a little bit of teaser for one right now. Um, I'm going to do, I think, around three or four more episodes, and then I'm, I'm going to um, change gears a little bit and then go and talk about the subject of masculinity. And so I do hope that you will enjoy that um, as it's brought up and uh, as, as we discuss that uh, here on this channel. Uh, there's a few more topics that I, I do want to get to, especially modern topics, um, especially as we approach uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as we get into those discussions as well. Uh, but I am super excited to get to those and I can't wait to show you what we have uh, down here, or I guess coming down the pike and uh I, I think it'll be i think you'll you'll enjoy it but again i hope you have a merry christmas a wonderful new year and um, if you want to uh, uh leave any suggestions for the channel please uh, leave that in the comment section and uh, i'll get back to you on that but i hope you guys have a good one see ya next time on pms the perilous journey to the new world